This is Distant Replay. Today on Distant Replay, we are going back watching a documentary. It's called Screwball. You might have heard of it. You probably have heard of it. It came out in 2018. You can find it on Netflix. Produced and directed by Billy Corbin, who has a lot of these really interesting and, and kind of, I guess, fast-paced documentaries. He's done a lot of work like Cocaine Cowboys is one of his more popular ones. But he takes on the MLB's infamous doping scandal, which was centered around Miami. You remember Biogenesis. You remember the people involved, A-Rod. But this really dives into what exactly happened. And it's pretty it's pretty eye-opening to find out that what I kind of assumed was this sweeping you know, move to clean up baseball by the MLB just ended up being one upset guy over a few thousand dollars that basically turned over everything. And just like a handful of guys isolated in, in Miami that kind of turned this whole thing upside down. This is an absolutely mind-blowing story. If you think you know about Biogenesis, you probably heard that name, or Tony Bosch, sort of the ringleader in all this, I'm telling you, you don't know half the story, and it's <laughs> worth listening to. Yeah, Billy Corbin does a really good job with this. He, he's, he, he's a very good filmmaker in general, but it's a very interesting way he does this because he tells the story very much like dr- drunk history. You ever watch that, Mike? I have, and that's what I thought of. It, that's a very good point. And Billy Corbin, Ben, also worth um, probably noting, the documentaries he's most known for before this one are Cocaine Cowboys, like you mentioned, and he's also the one who did both the U, the, the U 30 for 30 episodes on ESPN. Right. So he's very much Miami documentary guy, pretty much. And he does an excellent job. Yeah. So when I say drunk history, if you've never seen, if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, basically, he's u- using characters to tell the story through the voices of the people that it happened with. So they had they interviewed everybody, but they had kids dr- kind of dressed up and playing the parts of these nefarious characters in Miami. So you had, you know, little kids with slick back hair acting like. You know, gangsters, organized crime members. You got a guy dressed up like A-Rod, Porter Fisher, another big character, a very muscular guy. So it was very interesting and entertaining from that perspective. A very unique way to, to tell the story. And it worked. A lot of times when these documentarians try to get cute and portray a story in a unique way, it kind of overshadows what the story is actually about, but it fit perfectly in this case. And I guess because this, this story is kind of silly, right? I mean, that's what you think of when you think of, you know, kids telling the story. But it is kind of silly the way it all happened. And, you know, throughout it, they're kind of joking about it. And when you think about how it all kind of looks, you know, with MLB does not come out of this well, like it all kind of ends up feeling like a joke when it's all said and done. Uh, you guys are not, not going to believe the kinds of people that Alex Rodriguez, other professional players – and Major League Baseball were, were in cahoots with during this scandal. You're just not going to believe the kinds of people they were associating with. It's mind-blowing. And if it wasn't in a documentary, I don't know if I would believe it if you verbally told me about it. Yeah, no joke. And we'll go through it all on this episode. It's a really good one. Again, this is on Netflix. And we're going to uh, we go through a number of documentaries. We do one a week. So if you haven't subscribed to the show, don't follow us. Please make sure you do on whatever podcasting app you choose to listen on. And we're on YouTube as well. We'll have this video up there, and we appreciate everybody that subscribed commented over there we've uh, we've done a lot of stuff mike's been asking questions and taking polls and get a lot of good feedback on the youtube channel so please subscribe there but you can also find us on twitter and instagram let's jump into this and this story screwball all centers on tony bosch now i mean tony bosch is the name that i think everybody that pays attention to baseball and especially did during this era of the late 2000s early 2010s when kind of all this was unfolding Remember that name, right? Tony Bosch, and you remember Biogenesis. This is the guy. But, I mean, did you have any idea of his backstory? Oh, no no idea. So they basically went through here, Ben, about how he is a son of Cuban immigrants, right? His father was a licensed physician in South Florida. Tony grows up, right, wants to be a doctor, a little too caught up in being a party animal, not really too focused on school. So he takes the path of least resistance and goes to medical school in Belize, <laughs> right? Yeah. Comes back to the States, sort of meddles around a little bit, and then wants to get into the anti-aging business in Florida, which we learn in this is like a huge business, right? Of course, but yeah. the But the sort of hurdle Bosch has is he's not like a, a certified licensed doctor, medical doctor in the United States. Right. So in order to write prescriptions, he's got to get his dad and other doctors, including, you find out, a doctor who wasn't even alive, to write prescriptions for this hormone replacement therapy that he's putting regular people on. 
at first he's not working with athletes. He's basically working with people in Florida who want to look good when they live in Florida. I don't know how to describe it. It's a very Miami, South Florida kind of thing. I have a feeling the anti-aging business, but huge business down there. It was. And it's crazy because it basically the business started at a bar. He was like sitting like I picture him, you know, a beachside bar, right? Drinking some fruity drink with an umbrella, you know, scene you see out of pretty much every movie. And the guys ask him about like a workout regimen, essentially. And he kind of gives him, you know, some advice and what to take. And all of a sudden he's like, man, I could actually do this as a business. And it's <laughs> and he develops this recipe that kind of stays off a test. Now, the key was like having people follow it to a T. Right, which not everybody did along the way, and that's why some guys got busted because they overdid it or you know didn't take it at the right right increments, portions, timing, whatever it was. But it just starts like that, and it's crazy to hear that backstory that he's basically just he you know he does everything like they describe him in a you know white a doctor's coat right with the doctor Tony Bosch you know it's scripted on his on his shirt. He's wearing a stethoscope over his shoulders like he's an actual doctor, and just kind of makes everybody believe this, but. When you, you know, when you peel back the curtain, he's just, he's like just a black market dealer, you know, using his father to peddle these prescriptions. Yeah. He's got the white lab coat on. So everyone's like, oh, he must be a doctor. Oh, he's got a stethoscope. We don't need to look into it anymore. (laughs) You know, Uh, it's just funny. And it's, um, you know, he never planned to get involved with athletes, but the allure he saw in it once he got started was, you know, when I give someone my supplements, that's a regular person. I can't really see like the results in action when I put on my television. Right. But with athletes, I could put them on a regiment and see, wow, look at this guy's performance enhancing because of what I did. And he said that that was like the allure in working with athletes. So you got to remember, we're after the Balco scandal here and trainers and agents are trying to find ways to get around MLB's drug testing program. That's where this all starts. So the Mitchell report comes out, testing gets more stringent. How can we get around it? Right. And I was surprised to find out in this, Ben, his first high profile client was Manny Ramirez. Yep. Old Manny. And Manny, he described Manny in that first meeting, patting him down, looking for a wire, uh, which is great. I love I love the descriptions. The stories he told about Manny were unbelievable. Let me ask you, do you do you I mean, he's definitely a guy that is I would I would imagine is going to, you know, every story he tells, he's going to make it a little bit more elaborate than it was. Right. But I kind of seem to believe most of the stuff he said. I believe most of the stuff he said. I mean, the stuff that's like a matter of court record and a matter of like, you know, record in the media, you know, he's not lying about. There's no reason for him to lie about it because you could just look it up. Some of the other stuff, I believe it happened. Maybe maybe he embellished a little bit. But you know what? For the sake of a documentary, these stories were awesome. (laughs) Yeah, they were. I mean, talk about Manny, how he would travel around with Manny. So this is the time period in between like 2007 and 2009. So when Manny is on the Red Sox, but like transitioning to become a member of the Dodgers, like during that time frame, if you remember Manny's career Mm -hmm. and how he used to, Manny didn't like to sleep alone. So sometimes this guy would sleep, not in the same bed, but you know, in an adjoining bed in a room and talk Manny to sleep every night, like just bizarre stories. But then you don't think they're that bizarre because they involve Manny Ramirez. Right. And you know, it leads to the point where we all remember when Manny was a member of the Dodgers, where he tested positive. Yeah. Well, this gets back to what Ben said before. Manny had taken the drugs outside of the way he was supposed to take them. And this is the first time that attention comes to Tony Bosch and his father, who, again, is writing the prescriptions. This is the first time, like, media attention is on them for these anti-aging clinics. And I guess it was kind of weird because he explained when, when Manny got busted, and I don't remember this in terms of, you know, everything else going on in the world when that happened. Definitely remember Manny getting busted. He had that kind of breakout, kind of resurgence in his career, and it all you know added up after the fact. But Michael Jackson and Farrah Fawcett died the same at the same time that Manny's news came out. So essentially, anybody that cared about the Manny news or was covering it immediately put that to the side and paid attention to Michael Jackson and, and Farrah Fawcett more. Michael Jackson, but it, the, the news just kind of died out. Yeah, it died out, and he got very good advice. He didn't mention who gave him the advice, but the person told him. Lay low for a couple months, start your business back up, and your business is going to explode because of your connection to Manny. Yep. So people in a regular everyday life who are looking to lose weight, looking to put on muscle, they don't care that he gave a professional athlete performance-enhancing drugs. They look at it as like, wow, this guy helped Manny. Look how much it helped Manny. He could help me. And that's where he really kicks that hormone replacement therapy into high gear. And it's also where his his practice really takes off because now he's really integrating working with 
all kinds of athletes from professional yeah. athletes all the way down to even high school athletes. I mean, parents bringing their kids to Tony Bosch to put them on a hormone replacement therapy plan to improve their chances of playing college and professional baseball. Wild, right? That's just, that's just, that's deplorable. I mean, it's one thing for even, even like an upper echelon college player. I don't blame him as much or a professional player. Those are adults making decisions. They feel are right. But the stuff with the high school kids is it's, it's not, it's not defensible. Yeah, and, it, and it's on both sides, right? Like the parents bringing them there, but also Bosch. Like, why would even? I don't understand why you would even get in that business. To me, that opens the door that you don't want to go down. Like dealing with these professional athletes, you know, it's like guaranteed money, right? They're going to be quiet. They've got a lot on the line. They're not going to talk much, and that's a pretty solid business. Like, why even go down that road? Yeah, and you're getting cash from the players in most cases, which is another added benefit if you're doing mm -hmm. things in a shady way, and. The only thing I could think of, Ben, is the high school players. There's more of them in numbers. You know what I mean? I guess. So maybe I mean, it's it's a volume play or it's just someone who's so caught up in himself that he's not thinking clearly. Because one thing we learned throughout all of this is that Tony Bosch's personal habits become a major issue for him throughout drug use, alcohol, things of that nature. Yep. And, you know, during this time, we're introducing other characters involved in this this whole process. One of my favorite, Jorge Ugi Velasquez, the black market testosterone dealer. <laughs> yeah, that guy. I mean, but he's the one who got him connected to Alex Rodriguez, though, um, through his through yeah. A Rod's cousin. So you have you have Alex Rodriguez, okay, going through a black market testosterone dealer to get to Anthony Bosch. Anthony Bosch goes and meets A Rod, and the first words out of A Rod's mouth were, "I want whatever Manny was taking." Yeah, that's correct. Mind-blowing right? that Alex Rodriguez would be associating with characters like this. I mean, I know, look, I didn't think A-Rod was a saint. I think A-Rod's a phony. I think anyone who looks at things objectively thinks he's a phony. If you watch this documentary, he comes off completely terrible in it. Yeah. But his the program works for him that Bosch puts him on. I mean, Bosch, tell, at seven days after starting the program, he hits three home runs. Yeah. And A-Rod's hooked from there. How, how is A-Rod – why is A-Rod going to this meeting on his own, too? Why, why is that happening? This guy, this guy, his, his cousin Yuri, right, basically it's enough for A-Rod for his cousin to just be like, hey, this guy's a good person. I'm going to bring him to meet you and talk about using performance-enhancing drugs. How did they really know what this Anthony Bosch was all about, you know? And why would he be dealing – why didn't he keep Bosch at, at least an arm's length away? Yeah, why not have some kind of intermediary that can go and, and do, have these meetings and do everything he needs to? Like, there's I don't see any point why he's taking these meetings. Yeah, he he couldn't get someone else to like inject him. He had to have Bosch do it. And just some of the other stories he told about A Rod. Again, I don't know whether to believe all of them or not. If he's embellishing, but I mean, we've heard stories throughout the years about how strange A Rod is and how he's like very very self absorbed. Yeah. So I believe some of them. But he described A-Rod as just being extremely weird. Like A-Rod walking around his apartment that's all white in New York. Like everything's white with TVs playing highlights of himself that he's watching all day. <laughs> Dude, it doesn't get any weirder than that. A-Rod, yeah. He, he's a weird character altogether. It, it just years from these stories. And I think like these are the, some of the ones you're like, well, you know, maybe he's exaggerating and embellishing some of these stories. But then you think of like some of the stuff you've just you've seen A Rod do, right? You know, the picture in front of the mirror, like just some weird stuff that he's done, and you kind of go, yeah, I mean, I can kind of see that happening. Yeah, you you that's what I'm saying. Like with Manny and Al and A Rod, you've heard other similar stories throughout the years that it makes these believable. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I don't know why Tony Bosch would lie. At the point of this, he's recording this documentary. He's not in any legal trouble or anything like that, you know? Right. Yeah, very interesting. But now A-Rod, A-Rod's in the picture now, and and obviously that's that's the biggest name on this whole list that it, it was. There were some big ones, you know, throughout. I mean, a lot of guys that have connections to Miami was the biggest thing, and A-Rod being the biggest. But 2012 is when kind of everything started falling apart. Dominoes started falling as guys started getting busted. And, you know, Bosch has to kind of cut back because this is happening. But then we, we get introduced to this, this Porter Fisher guy. So he's another, he obviously plays a huge role in the story. I don't know if this is a name that anybody recognizes just off of me saying it, unless you know the story. Did you, like, does this guy's name, 
Did it ring a bell at all to you before you watched this? Not at all. So Ben mentioned his turning point. So you probably remember, if you're a baseball fan, you might remember when Melky Cabrera and, uh, and uh, Bartolo Colon tested positive in 2012. Well, those are both Anthony Bosch clients. So that's what gets kind of him on the radar of everyone in regards to this. And like Ben said, he, he's, he, sh- he cuts back his business, so then he's strapped for cash because he's living this exorbitant lifestyle with the drugs, the women, the alcohol, and he still has the same amount of staff, but he's doing less business, right? And he's running low on funds, and this guy, Porter Fisher, who's basically a guy, kind of a hanger-on, kind of a guy that's maybe one of those guys that kind of lifts weights in really good shape. He's tan, but he's a little bit of a loser kind of. I mean that in like a respectful way. Like he's just a guy who always wants to be around like, oh man, like I want to be friends with you. I want to be involved in stuff. Like just like not a very like what you would call like a cool guy, kind of like a latcher on type. Yeah. Well, Bosch looks at him as like the perfect person. Like I need a loan to float me for a little while. This guy Porter is always asking how he can get involved in my business. Here's a perfect way for him to do it. He asked this guy Porter, and this blows my mind. For a four thousand dollar loan for his business, Ben, can I just tell you something and tell our listeners something? <laughs> if you are looking to invest in a business, and someone says, "Hey, I need a loan for my business, and I need four thousand dollars," don't even listen to the rest of the pitch and say no. Okay, That's any business flag, investment, huh? any business investment is going to be a lot more than four thousand dollars. And as we find out with Porter Fisher, if four thousand dollars is a lot of money to you, you especially shouldn't be looking to invest in a business. He was like trying to. He, he just wanted to. He wanted to help them with marketing. He's like, I don't know why you guys aren't doing better. This this product's incredible that you're giving me. I want to. I want to be a spokesman. I'll do free marketing for you. And then, and once they realized he came into some money, which he came into money by getting hit on a bicycle, <laughs> riding a bike, gets hit, sues, gets some money, and now he has a little money. And that's when Bosch is like, Oh, you got money? Okay, now I'll actually talk to you. How about you invest in the business? We'd love to make you an employee. And I love that the CFO was even like, Hey. Are you sure you want to do this? Like, ask him multiple times. Are you sure you want to invest in this business? And he's like, yeah, 4000 I can get, you know, I can make what? what was he making 20% return on that loan slash investment? Yeah. How <laughs> Bosch told him is, oh, you give me 4000 4, I'll give you 4800 at the end of the month or something like that, or in two weeks or something. Something like... There's a million red flags here, but this guy right. Porter, I'm telling you, like he wants to be a part of it. He wants to have friends like that's he's a sucker, you know, and let's just put it what it is. And he that's that's the allure for him. But of course, Bosch, you know, on cocaine, alcoholic business falling apart. He doesn't live up to his end of the bargain. This guy can't afford to pay eight hundred a four thousand dollar loan back. OK, hmm. this is the depth he's at. And to make it even funnier, like this guy. Fisher is like stalking Bosch for these payments he's supposed to get every two weeks or every month. Yeah. And this dude's going scorched earth to get his three or $4,000 back. And it becomes eventually like a major sticking point in this whole scandal. Was this guy feeling like he got gypped out of his $4,000 investment? And I can't tell you how much this blew my mind. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Baseball basically almost got taken down because of a four thousand dollar loan that wasn't repaid on time. When I heard that, I was like, "Is this is this is really what happened? We're really talking about all these guys were brought down because of a four thousand dollar investment that didn't get paid back, and he got paid back a little bit of it, I think. Um, so it might not have even been a full four thousand. But I was like, "How how is this what brings down baseball? So it's crazy to even think about that. But yeah, he he was." He was so upset about this that he's going through and, and taking files and stuff out of Bosch's office, which I I can't remember if I'd heard the story or if I'd just seen this documentary when it first came out a few years ago and it just kind of was in the back of my mind. But the whole story about you know how all this actually, how all the information he had got out of his hands and into the hands of the guys that were playing the MLB is why is again another crazy ass story. This guy Fisher goes snooping around the office, finds all Bosch's records connecting him to athletes, okay? Then he decides, oh, let me Google the guy that I gave $4,000 to, finds out about his connection with Manny from what he says, steals the books from Bosch that kind of connect him to athletes, then goes running to the media, and that's where the lid gets blown off of all this. Yeah, He meets with a reporter from the Miami New Times, 
starts to tell him about what Bosch is up to, shows him one of the books that he stole from Bosch as like proof. Porter at this point wants to just ruin Anthony Bosch over four thousand dollars. You can't stress and, that enough. And he gets a pro- <laughs> he gets approached by some associates of Bosch who are like shady businessmen type. Like, hey, listen, we don't want you to go to the media. What do you need to sort of make this go away? And Porter's like, I just want my money. And they're like, you want $4,000 to not go to the media? And like within a day, they had the $4,000 to him. But at that point, the story, it was too late for the story not to run. And Porter Fisher didn't do anything to make the story stop running. Um, And the story eventually ran in the Miami New Times. And that is what blew the lid off on what we now know as the biogenesis scandal. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the Miami New Times when it first came out. I'd never heard of that publication ever. Sounded fake. But they were the first ones to kind of tell that story. But but again, there was like really nothing to to tie any of these guys down as far as the Major League Baseball is concerned. And that's why they, they created like their own independent investigation. It, it, division. It, Investig- it's, it, it, investigative it, division to, to kind of go in and look at these guys. Yeah, so the article comes out. And what you don't know at the time is those books I was telling you that Porter Fisher stole – as a part of getting the $4,000 from the shady businessmen associated with Bosch, the Carbone brothers, they're called, and their associates, they gave the books to the Carbone. He gave the books to the Carbone brothers. So in exchange for the $4,000, the Carbone brothers then make a copy of them on a flash drive, sell the books to A-Rod's people, okay, sell the copy of the books to Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball tells them, hey, look, we'll give you this amount for the flash drive, but if we could have, like, hard copies of this stuff, we can give you more money. They set Porter Fisher up to steal the books out of his car, and then they sell those to MLB. So these Carbone brothers end up making the most money of anyone involved. A-Rod goes in full defense mode, as we know now, once he's outed in this in this report, Okay. I didn't know, Ben. Did you know that he's the one who outed his people or the one who ones who outed Ryan Braun and Francisco Cervelli? Uh-uh. They, no. Basically, A-Rod's people want, were like, hey, look, the more people that are involved in this, maybe A-Rod won't bear the brunt of it. Ryan Braun, obviously a University of Miami player who was hooked up with Bosch, went on to the Brewers, obviously. But Cervelli was A-Rod's teammate. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> it, it's just such a tangled web. And when it comes down to it, Ben, this is all about, it becomes all about Major League Baseball versus A-Rod. Major League Baseball trying to save their reputation, A-Rod trying to save his reputation, and just a bunch of collateral damage in between. But the worst part was, like, not only did, did both these high, high profile, powerful figures in A-Rod and baseball both get played by these, these con men in Miami, selling, the, selling them the same documents. Like, A-Rod wanted to buy them so MLB couldn't get them, right? MLB wanted to buy them, obviously, so they had their hands on them. And they're selling them to both parties, right? And these guys are trying to investigate, and, like, nobody wants to speak to them. Like, Porter Fisher has nothing to do with, with the Major League Baseball investigators that are coming in, trying to talk to him. This, this one of the investigators sleeps with one of the people involved, one of the witnesses of this whole thing. Like, the head, like, one of the head guys in this investigation is sleeping with the witness. Then, then this whole this whole story of the break in to steal these things from his car when he stops at a tanning bed, stops at a tanning bed to get his application, and the guys in the tanning bed basically go out in the car and break his window and steal his stuff or have his have their buddy do it. But they basically were on watch while it happened, and he comes out of the tanning bed and his window is broken, and of course they like break the other guy that works there's window to make it look like, you know. They're all innocent and they're all victims of this thing, right? When really they're the ones behind it. I mean, it's just all so bizarre. But I couldn't help but just being like, how is MLB, and a lot of this centers around Rob Manfred, who's now the commissioner, right? Who obviously has a pretty questionable reputation, especially with a lot of players um, over the last few years and since he's taken over. And you kind of see that he headed this thing up. And it's like, and this guy's had some issues. You know, dating back to even really, really before he even really knew who he was, and like his his main target in this investigation is to break down a Rod, but now like a Rod is like the face of MLB analysts for like World Series coverage. Yeah, uh, it's just so confusing to me. And obviously, we're leading down the path here when all this stuff becomes public. 
the, the battle between A Rod and the MLB leading to A Rod's like 211 game suspension, right? That's where this is all leading to. Yeah. And A Rod lying at every turn about what he did and what he didn't do, like just blatantly lying to everyone and for ruining his reputation forever. He'll never get in the Hall of Fame, I don't think. And just like, but now this guy is very, very closely associated with MLB. He almost he almost got ownership in a team. Yeah. It, it's just such a, a tangled web. And you find out Rob Manfred, now the commissioner, is at the forefront of this whole, hey, let's get as much as we can on A-Rod so we can bury him. And in order to do that, again, we're going to associate with the low of the low in terms of criminals. Mm-hmm. It's just so mind blowing. That's also mind blowing too. That you know, Tony Bosch says he wasn't even approached by Major League Baseball to get information. Like he had to set up a, an interview with Pedro Gomez. Rest in peace. Um, awesome guy. Did a great job. Obviously has the Miami Cuban connections down there. But I guess they he knew of. They were kind of friends with the same school or something. Whatever it was. But basically reached out to Pedro to set up that that really weird interview, bizarre interview that we saw on ESPN where, you know, Bosch basically looks drunk, probably is drunk or on drugs and doesn't really give a whole lot of information. It looks like Gomez just finds him on the street and kind of, you know, comes up to him and interviews him when it was all kind of set up to begin with. planned, yeah. (laughs) They had hung out beforehand. You know what it looks like? You know when you take a shower and the shower just doesn't take and you get out of the shower and you're still kind of sweating. You're like, why the hell am I sweating? That's what Tony Bosch looked like with his shirt all like half unbuttoned, sweating. Soda shovel. Like with Pedro Gomez, who they painted as like his friend. Right. And it made it look like like he stopped him in the middle of the street. It yeah. was a bizarre scene. But what that interview does do is it lets MLB know, hey, Tony Bosch is willing to talk to you if you want to talk to him. So yeah. Bosch is basically making the determination now, I'm going to side with Major League Baseball because they're a billion-dollar company who could destroy me over A-Rod, who, yeah, he's worth a lot of money, but he's not Major League Baseball. Yeah. So that begins like the partnership, for lack of a better term, between Bosch and Major League Baseball to try to bring A-Rod down. And it works. It works. And I love that they had that meeting. And again, the, the details of that meeting, when they're all in there together and Bosch is in there sitting across the table from A-Rod and A-Rod's like making faces. And what's more bizarre, that's bizarre, A-Rod making faces at him. And then right from there, Ben, literally right yeah. from that meeting, he goes to Mike Francesa's studio, who was like the big... At the time, the huge sports talk guy in New York sits in studio and completely lies to Francesa about everything and digs his hole even deeper. (laughs) He goes right from the hearing, right to the studio with Francesa, lies his face off some more, and he's just such a phony because Francesa has a lot of quirks and people may not like him, but he had A-Rod's back at every turn during his entire time with the Yankees. And if you, I thought at the time, hey, if there's one person he's going to be honest with, it's going to be Francesa, but he just completely ruined everything that day. Well, A. Rod obviously gets taken down, then eventually Bosch does too, which they kind of update everybody's progress. But he eventually had to plead guilty, um, conspiracy to dist- distribute testosterone, which he never really kind of. It doesn't seem like he'd ever would have stopped, you know, if given the option. He ne- no, he never, he never would have stopped it. And what eventually brings him down is what we talked about before: is supplying the high schoolers. Yeah, he gets four months for that in prison. Sorry, four years for that in prison. Serves twenty months of that sentence. And what a crazy story this was! And again, it only blew up because that guy Fisher Porter Fisher felt like he got screwed out of four thousand dollars. Porter Fisher now, founder and CEO of the Porter Project, which. It's a nonprofit working to abolish the illegal use and distribution of the uh, performance-enhancing drugs. Oh, say it, Porter, no one cares, buddy. I mean, seriously. God, just get some friends and, like, move on with your life. Uh, Porter uh, Fisher God. fires you up. I love it. What I mean, like, I, honestly, I didn't know whether to have him. I know, exactly. <laughs> I didn't know whether to feel really bad for the guy or think, like, look, this guy's just a loser. I didn't, I didn't know. I'm still kind of confused by that. I feel bad for him. I mean, but yeah, you know, I feel I mean, bad for him in some ways, but some ways it's like now he's trying to capitalize off it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's just a, a, a fascinating, fascinating documentary and a, and a fascinating story that I don't think people know the details about because, again, some of the details about A Rod in this documentary, it, I don't think people think highly of A Rod anyway, but if you watch this, it's impossible to me that you could 
ever even want to associate with the guy or ever take him seriously again. Because he's cleaned up his image, it seems like, over the last four or five years. In the public, but he's a phony. Yeah. That's what phonies do. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't think this documentary would get you so worked up, but it it did. It did its job. But it's a good one. In the end, Ben, I could make it sound like I don't care about steroids. I don't care who does steroids. But I love baseball. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's just a clown who, for a lot of people, he ruined baseball for him. And this whole era did. This era combined with the, you know, the Mitchell Report era, we'll call it. And you think after the Mitchell Report comes out, okay, this is not going to work anymore. The gig is up. But you have two guys in Manny and A-Rod, along with others, Ryan Braun, another MVP, that it just shows the degree these guys will go to to try to game the system, even when they know in all likelihood it's going to lead to them getting caught. Yep. Well, this documentary, again, I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more attention. And maybe it did when it came out, and maybe just people are over the whole steroids era. They don't really care. It's a really good documentary, and it's yeah. it's worth your time if you're at all interested in that that time in Major League Baseball because it does have quite a few details that I wasn't aware of and really does a good job breaking down the story and how everything unfolded. So, And you know what's nuts is this Billy Corbin, Ben. This is, this is an excellent documentary, and it's probably the fourth most documentary he's known for. Yeah, probably. You know what I mean? He might even have more documentaries that I'm not aware of that are better, even just better than this too. But the Cocaine Cowboys is one of the best documentaries I've ever, I've ever seen, period. Mm-hmm. It's not about sports, but. And then the U, both parts of that, you know, if you don't know that story, which I think most sports fans would know, but that's mind-blowing as well, the rise of Miami football. Mm-hmm. And uh, just so, so, so fantastically done. Yeah, he did a good one too on um... – Another 30 for 30 called Broke, which was on NBA players. I can't believe I forgot that one. Being that, broke, was, yeah. that was awesome as well. That We'll put that one on our list. I know that we'll do that one at some point. But, um, yeah, really interesting. Really interesting uh, documentary and would highly recommend it. Again, you can find it on Netflix. It is called Screwball, and uh, it's it's an easy watch. It's about an hour and a half. But definitely, where would you what would, what would you give this one, Mike? Uh, we don't really rate these things very much, but maybe we should start Let's just that say – uh, it's probably as good as it can get. Could it have been 15 or 20 minutes shorter? Probably. Yeah. We'll get, I'll give it a nine out of 10. Yeah. I think you could, you could boil it down to hour, hour 15 probably, but still. We should do Billy Corbin month. <laughs> we should just do all Billy Corbin documentaries. I'm down. He's got a lot of good stuff. That he I, does. I he does. We'd really enjoy if we went all the way through it. Um, so yeah, put that on the list. All right. Got to get out of here. Please subscribe to the show. If you don't do that already on YouTube, Follow us on whatever podcasting app you choose to listen on. You'll find us everywhere. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram as well. As always, Mike, enjoyed the conversation. Same here, Ben. Rate, subscribe, like, anything positive you can do, we appreciate. And until next time.